Mr. Olson, Mrs. Olson, good morning or good afternoon, whatever time of the day it is at your place. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening to you. Good morning from us. <laughs> oh, that's right. We we have a ten hour a ten hour difference. Yeah, yes. between Moscow and your place. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for joining us for our Fall Educators Conference. And oh, you're very, you're very welcome. We always <laughs> love to come to, to Moscow and be at your Educators Convention. And because of the pandemic, we can't travel, but we're here. <laughs> exactly this way. We, we actually, we were hoping that uh, this year we would be able to gather more people. And uh, as you are aware, last year was our 30th anniversary that we moved to this year in hope that this year would be offline. But somehow we have to enjoy the hybrid version of our conference. And yeah. but we're very happy that you join us. Thank and uh, last, year, last year we had our theme for, uh, for the convention uh, thriving in the time of uncertainty. And uh, you shared a lot of, and you, Mr. Olson, you, Mrs. Olson, you shared a lot of good stuff about uh, the Asian experience. And uh, we were able to use some of, of your thoughts and ideas and encouragement in our area. But this year we thought that, well, we thought it would be over by this time, but changes <laughs> keep coming <laughs> up. <laughs> just keep coming up and uh, we have to continue embracing them and accommodating all the new things that are coming up and yet we want our organizations to be more effective uh, even in this time so we thought at this conference uh, we would gather information from different regions of the world to see how you are embracing change uh, today and uh, so, Miss Olson, just tell us one more time, because I'm sure that lots of people know about uh, your area, Miss Olson, what area you are over and what All is right. happening now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we are over School of Tomorrow Asia, uh, which come, came into being in 2005, so a long time ago. Um, and uh, we have, I think, about 27 countries that we work with. We have, I have seven teams in seven different areas of Asia uh, that I work with on basically a daily basis. Uh, we have, I think, close to 400 schools and uh, we're, we're busy every day with something new, something different coming up. Uh, and of course, uh, I've been involved with ACE, a school of tomorrow for over 40 years, 44 years, I think it is. And so we have a lot of experience and uh, uh, we just have a great time with our uh, consultants, with our teams um, in Asia. That's what we do. <laughs> and I have been involved with the ACE program since 1975, which mm -hmm. makes about, what, 46 years, I believe. Wow. Oh. Wow. And yes, Mr. Olson, Mrs. Olson, we... Well, we all know that you also made a great contribution in our area, and that's why we feel really very comfortable and very much at home talking to you and asking you to share your experience with us. Okay, Mrs. Olson, specifically, which countries you're working with? Because you said Asian area, but some people, you know, they have different ideas what Asia is all about. Yes, <laughs> well, our, I'll give you maybe the, the seven main areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I work with uh, many countries, uh, a lot of them have consultants. So for instance, India would be one area with a consultant there and then uh, Pakistan. And then there would be Far East Asia, which would be Thailand, um, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, and then uh, Japan and then Korea and then uh, Malaysia and Singapore and um, China, <laughs> Japan, <laughs> just, there's all kinds of all kinds of countries with different scenarios, actually, um, that are happening within them. And I'm also responsible for the countries in the Middle East. So yes, it's all very interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's very interesting because <laughs> once you have this, uh, this area that is so wide and so wonderful, uh, you can really have a lot of input from different like you said consultants and uh, yes. my question is do you keep in touch with um do you keep in touch also with canada 
I once in a while we talk a little bit but yeah <laughs> I'm from Canada so I talk with my parents all the time <laughs> and they give their greetings by the way Mr. Oh. and Mrs. Raza who were in Russia <laughs> when I was there <laughs> oh thank you so much we appreciate that and Miss Tolson do you keep in touch with what is happening in the United States of America well uh somewhat yes uh actually you know all the schools both private and uh public Mm -hmm. uh, during the pandemic, uh, for the for the most part, have been online, and so it's really changed what was going on here. Uh, one of the real advantages for the ACE curriculum is that that uh, they were already uh, prepared for individual learning, and so uh, so that that really helped out the program. We found that many many parents now. Uh, rather than being connected with other schools, are using the ACE curriculum um, because of that. And so the homeschool area has grown very much during the pandemic. In fact, there, there are many of the parents now that say they are very happy to, to be homeschooling their children and are not sending them back to public school. Uh, however, there are other parents that are frustrated because they've been with their children all during the pandemic and now they're ready to send their kids back to school. And so in some areas, uh, there's a big debate, you know, whether to send them, whether to not, whether to have open school, whether not. And so it, there's still a lot up in the air in the United States. Uh, you see, I just wanted to also to, to mention for the sake of our conference that the subtitle of our or subtopic of our con conference is, uh, uh, I'll just I'll read it out loud, is educational tools, uh, motivational strategies, approaches and tools for increasing or making your organization, your school more effective. And I would say when we say your school we mean parents students and teachers and uh, administration everybody so from what we already you already shared Ms. Tolson so the first thing is that number one those who were involved with the school of tomorrow and were familiar with the individualized approach not just uh, like giving a lip service to this term but really working with it and knowing how to work it so they really benefited uh, from this approach when the pandemic uh, kicked in. And secondly, yeah. you mentioned about the parents that uh, uh, many parents now switch to homeschooling. And I will say that now at the International School of Tomorrow, we have 3,100 homeschoolers. Yes. And yes. they are doing the Russian program. Some of them do the School of Tomorrow as well. But you, I, I would uh, totally agree with you that parents find it instrumental to switch to homeschooling versus going to school in person and doing it offline. Though, of course, there are pros and cons, and we'll talk about it maybe later in our, in our session. And Mrs. Olson, you mentioned such countries, for example, as India. I am personally interested in India. What is going on yes. there? Like, what kind of changes took place and how the schools are handling all those changes? Right. That was um, uh, quite the, the deal because in India, I don't think that they really acknowledged the pandemic. Everybody kept kind of, you know, going on, except for they did close down the schools, all the mm. public schools, all, all the schools. And in fact, the schools are not even open at the moment mm. um, and so they've just kept the schools closed and so uh, our schools went online um, and it was quite the challenge for them mm -hmm. because uh, uh, parents would either be working or not or whatever but they have a set of parents that are mm -hmm. involved it could be the grandparents or the parents and they became involved and they became involved and understood and learned to understand the program more so it actually was a very good situation because the parents uh, would leave the kids at school or the students at school and then just expect some, some miracle to happen and everything would be fine. But now that we went online and they understand what the students need to do every day, they are really learning and understanding and appreciating the program more than ever. So it actually has been um, a good experience. I mean, it's, it's, 
hard work for the supervisors, for the teachers, for the monitors, for, for everybody involved, but it has become something that they've uh, loved to do. And uh, I've been able to uh, go online when, when some schools have been online and go into their Zoom rooms or their learning centers. And it's so exciting to see what they're doing and how they're doing it and uh, how they're doing the pace work and just get really involved. And, and they do more than pace work. They've, they've done uh, um, things, different things together where they do their exercises or, you know, this and that. So yeah, it's well-rounded actually. It's very interesting. <laughs> You know, now that you're mentioning all those things, we did the same, the same stuff, doing even uh, our art classes online, do, yeah. doing our PE classes online. Uh, but in the last probably five or six months, we mostly spent our time uh, on campus. And uh, now that I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, wow, we did it too. <laughs> And, yes. And uh, uh, but God knows we might have to resort to those uh, methods again because uh, still in Russia we have a rule: if one of the children is sick with this uh, disease or is infected, then the whole the whole learning center has to be quarantined for a couple of weeks. Yes. And so in this case we have to yeah do it at least partially for for the whole school. Okay, uh, another country that I know is a big area in is very big in terms of uh uh in terms of school of tomorrow involvement is Malaysia. Yes. And uh, yeah. Yeah, they've also had a a huge challenge and have been mm -hmm. shut down uh the whole time and in fact some schools are still shut down and some schools can only have uh let's say kindergarten students in mm -hmm. uh, for like half a day or something like that so i know one school who's celebrating 20 years this year i get to do a, a an online congratulations uh message for them but they have been shut down since the very beginning they have not been able to go back they're in in an area where they can't the the, the numbers are so high so um that has been hard for them it's been hard um in many of the areas to to even go back to the to their school building they can't they're they're everybody's monitored they have to stay at home. Uh, they can't move around and, and they have all these rules on traffic and moving. And then if you, if you want to go from one place to the other, you have to get permission and, mm -hmm. um, and you have to have a really good reason to move. And so it's, it's been very difficult for the schools there, but they are encouraged to keep going and um, they're, they're still going. And uh, our educators convention last year was amazing. Everybody was online and excited and excited to meet with each other. And of course, we would rather be face to face, but uh, online is better than not doing anything. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, now that you, you've mentioned very interesting things about uh, actually the real lockdown in many countries uh, that, as I mentioned already, also, uh, we were blessed not to uh, not to have it for too long a time so and they say in many reports that uh, today uh, a so-called digital inequality is increasing meaning that not everybody has internet not everybody has gadgets or not everybody has proper gadgets and even in russia some families have three or four children and they have to share one computer and this one computer might be used even by mom and dad for their online work. And then, of course, it makes a mess. It makes it a mess for everybody. So yeah. how is it happening in the countries of your area? For example, in Thailand, in Myanmar, in Laos. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, uh, yes, the countries are very different. I actually didn't hear very uh, uh, much trouble for Far East Asia, which you just named those mm -hmm. countries there. Mm -hmm. um, I did. There are some issues with internet availability, but maybe not mm -hmm. necessarily uh, um, devices. They can they can get devices. The issue for devices would be Pakistan or mm -hmm. India a little bit. But India has a lot of devices, but um, uh, Malaysia also had. Uh, a lot of trouble with uh, internet connection. Uh, 
And so that would be uh, more so than necessarily devices, I think. Mm, okay. So then digital inequality is not the issue for Asia. So that would, would that would be that would be uh, there's something to be expected because yes, Asia yes. is known even in Russia for being a gadget like uh, heaven. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There, there, there are some there are some areas where some of the people have not had uh, internet devices but have borrowed from maybe mm. an uncle or something right, like that. Right. That would be Pakistan. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and so they have they have come up with with. Uh, with ideas and ways to to make it work yes mm, i see all right uh then i also wanted just to ask you about this this uh, uh another issue uh do you think uh teachers parents maybe students especially do they feel uh like they are in social isolation these days because they are on the lockdown, as you mentioned, they have to report or they have to even some people have devices that uh, that they're monitored where they are. So what would you say about this? Yeah, I, I think it I think it depends on the person uh, from mm. what I've seen or heard. Some people love to be by themselves. So the mm. social isolation was not a problem for them. <laughs> Although after so long, if they couldn't go back for, to school for a little while, mm. it becomes monotonous after a while. Mm. Um, but those mostly, everybody really wants to get back to, to, to on-site. Um, mm. In fact, in Malaysia, when they were able, there was a little break in some places in Malaysia, not in every place, but in some mm -hmm. places where they could go back online, it was like they felt like they were in heaven. They were back together again <laughs> and that they were so excited to be together, even though they had to uh, follow all the standard operating procedures for this. They had to be six feet apart. They had to wear a mask and they had to do this and they had, mm -hmm. had to do that. They were just so happy to be back together again. And then, of course, that was short lived and then they had to go back online. But most, uh, yeah, most everybody wants to be back together again. I see. And how about high school students? Uh, that's uh, because in many, in many countries, the universities uh, are not available anymore for foreign students. For example, our Vitaly, he wanted to go to an Australian, Australian university. You know why he wound up? He wound up in the Russian military. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Because uh, he, he could not go to a university and he decided why then bothering and he decided to go to the military, which is an obligatory service in Russia. And he's studying now, and still universities are not open in Australia. So, how do students feel about, and parents feel about this aspect? They they basically cannot go to any foreign university. Um, well, I was surprised to hear actually several students that have come to the U.S. and they've let them in mm. to come mm. to university. Um, there's a big uh, quarantine regulation. Uh, thing that they have to do and when they come in or whatever, but they're here. And so, um, and, and I know of others from even Korea that have uh, come in to do some like research on where they could go. And so I am not sure, maybe some of them had some American connection, maybe that they were able to do that, <laughs> even though they're Chinese or Korean or Malaysian or something. Maybe that was the reason why for them in particular. Um, but a lot of, yeah, a lot of parents have had to and, and students have had to rethink where they want to go next. Um, and it has, like, for instance, in Thailand, uh, some of the students have been able to enter into uh, the top universities there. And that's been so exciting for us and for our programs because they've just decided to stay. And then they decided, well, let's see if we can get into the, the highest universities here and they're getting in. So that's been a bonus for them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, you know, God always, God always has a plan for us. This is not a surprise to him. And God has a plan for our lives. And I'm even thinking of our son 
who, I, you know, college on site is would be much better than college online, but mm -hmm. he's had to do college online now for the second year. And then there might be some rules and regulations that he might not be able to comply with if he goes on site next year. And we're not worried about it because God has the right plan for him mm -hmm. and he will go in the right direction. And God is not surprised. <laughs> yeah, you know, in terms of uh, giving encouragement to people and in terms of how to make uh, our ministry, our school more effective, you know, uh, many of the speakers actually share the same thing that we need to rely on God. Because as you said, that he's not surprised by, surprised by what is happening. And he has a plan for everyone. And if we only acknowledge it, that he has a plan for every one of us, and these things are not happening just accidentally, it's all for a reason. And uh, as you just mentioned, that uh, students in Thailand, uh, the graduates, benefited from the lockdown because they were able to enter top universities in their own country, which is yes. great because that's a good proof of the solid, good, rounded education at the high school. That's, that's, yeah. that's perfect. Okay, um, let's go back to teachers. Um, in Indonesia, 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 Malaysia, other countries, uh, do you think when all these changes began to take place, the teachers were unprepared for those changes? I don't think so. I mean, yes, we don't want to. We naturally, as human beings, maybe don't like change, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we can't adapt. Um, mm -hmm. I know uh, one of the consultants says um, to be ready in season and out season, out of season, wherever God wants us to be and whatever mm -hmm. God wants us to do. So um, they adapted. They thought, well, uh, what? how do we do this? What do we do? And, uh, and it became actually uh, more uh, simplistic than other programs because we have an individualized program. All we had to do was we didn't have to create a particular curriculum to be online. We took what we had and we, instead of being in the learning center, we were at home. And that's the basics of it. Now, of course, there's the specifics of how to score and how to do a test because we don't want to, uh, to, to give our score keys out or things like that. But they figured it out and they do it and it works. Now, and this is an interesting uh, extension of, once again, the concept of the individualized program because every student, you need to individualize his program now you've got to individualize even greater in the new situation. And, and so the, the supervisors have, have gone through training. They, they know what to do for an individual student. Then when a, when a different scenario comes up, then, they, then they're able to adjust without so much difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, some of the uh, schools that have, uh, that have had uh, you know, teacher-oriented uh, classrooms now, they, those, many of those teachers have had a very, very difficult time adjusting, but those that have been using the ACE program, as you see, have, have, uh, have a real advantage. They've adjusted very well and quickly. Okay, Ms. Tolson, then I have a question to you, and it's a loaded question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> some, some of the studies say that, uh, of course, uh, with all the changes coming up, and uh, people had to plunge into technology because they had to use Zoom and uh, like Google things and whatever. And uh, some say that, uh, that those people of age had a more difficult time adapting to all the new technologies. So would you agree with that? <laughs> and, if, and if not, why? <laughs> all right. Well, you you uh, you probably have gotten some good information there because I think that that's probably true. We that have a few more years on us, you know, we become a little more set in our ways, mm -hmm. and it's a little harder to uh, make some of those adaptations. But with the ACE program, mm -hmm. even we older uh, generations have mm -hmm. have. Uh, have seen the need to adapt. Mm -hmm. And really, when you think about it, uh, five years ago, we did not have the technology that we have today, which mm -hmm. allows the online uh, uh, presentation to, to go so, so well. 
and uh, mm -hmm. and of course you just jump in and you have to learn, and and uh, and you can do so. And and I thank God for the advances in technology which has allowed that during this time. You know, when I said the, the question was loaded, actually the study shows that age has nothing to do with it. And they yes. say that a lot of people who are of age, they, I mean, when I say of age, I mean, people older generation, so they were able to adapt. Uh, they might not have all the bells and whistles in technology, but, but as long as they uh, were willing to accommodate those changes, they were able to use Zoom, they were able to use all the presentations, all the technologies, and vice versa, younger generation teachers who would say, and I have, I have actually a teacher I know, and she would tell me, Zoom is not for me, online is not for me, this is just, it gives me a stress, I'm not doing it, forget about it, you know what, she was not able to do it. And she would be stressed out every time she would do an online class. And uh, that was a really difficult time for her. And of course, the learning of technology was not happening because she was opposing those things. Uh, right. But the study shows that as long as we want to serve our kids, we use whatever is available at the moment. And uh, yes. the mere reason that you agreed to be a part of this online session, it's the proof of the pudding in the eating <laughs> but remember eating it but remember mr lynn i'm only old on the outside i know you know people should see how you're still doing this this stand on the on the pole just just really making the whatever you're doing there but that's that's amazing i cannot do it i cannot do it oh, that's that's great that's again that's another proof that yes it has to do on uh, everything has to do on the inside, however we feel, however we want to adapt. And uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I also believe that the School of Tomorrow teachers had a great, um, uh, great, gr maybe not a greater, but really great ability to adapt uh, using the online, uh, using the individualized approach in the learning center on a daily basis. Yes, I had one of the consultants, I just mm -hmm. want to say this, put this in here. One of the consultants mm -hmm. just mentioned this he said, we need to be fat. We need to be faithful, uh -huh. available, and teachable. So I thought that would fit faithful, that. Fit available, and teachable. and teachable. That's good. That's good. <laughs> faithful, available, and teachable. That's great. Okay. Uh, we have a few more minutes, okay, for, for our session. And um, uh, I wanted to ask you about the students. So that's what they say in the uh, modern research, that the students today are more social media affected they spend more time in virtual reality they experience more health hazards uh, they are more independent from their parents and they are given to clip thinking so would you say these are the tendencies that students or your schools experience in the student body today uh -huh. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> and, and of course, that's a general observation, I would think. Um, and our students, I haven't heard those specific um, complaints necessarily, mm -hmm. because the students really, they have goals. They have learned to set goals. Now, maybe new students coming in that they're just learning how to set goals and they maybe have issues that they need to overcome. And there are, there are going to be issues because parents and students and teachers, everybody's at home and, and people go through different issues at, at the time. But you know, our students, they've set goals and they, they want to accomplish their goals. Now, an interesting thing also concerning that is, yes, before the pandemic, I think this was probably so that, that, that students were using so much time on the internet and things, but now they have to use that time on their studies. So it takes it takes some of that back to, to ownership in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, then what I'm hearing from you that, um, again, the School of Tomorrow environment, even uh, applied virtually, it has actually helped the students to overcome those challenges. And uh, spending, time more, spending more time in virtual reality does not affect them really socially. That, and would you say their health is still okay? 
So they're finding ways how to keep up with the- I, I, I believe so, but I think this all also has to do with the parent involvement because mm -hmm. the parents have made it clear they only want their students so much on the computer, so much time. And so that time needs then to be focused on schoolwork. So, so they're helping their children, their students manage that. You can be on time for this much time and then you must, we must do something else. We, we can't do that. And we've made boundaries for, for the staff. The staff can't be up uh, at all night answering the students' questions. The students have to work between so many hours and then that's it. And so the, it's, it's a discipline of the parents also to be more involved with their, with their children because I think before the pandemic, the, the children were off doing something, the parents were off doing something and, the, and the, they just wanted some miracle to happen when they sent their students to the school and it was up to the teachers to do something. And it was really hard for the teachers to get parental involvement. But now they've, they've had to, the parents have had to step up and, and the parents that have stepped up have really helped their students and have really become, they've become a family because um, one of my consultants said, what we need to do is have more tools for the parents to understand how to raise their children and how to, how to be with their students, be, be present. And mm -hmm. so I think that's been a, a plus during mm -hmm. this time. You know, as you were sharing about parental involvement, uh, it somehow triggered in, in my mind uh, the four basics uh, the school of tomorrow stands on. And one of them is back to parents. Yes, <laughs> Just, back to basics. Uh, yeah. Back to basics, back to God, back to an individual. But yeah. this back, to, back to parents is, is, I think this is one of the things that we may say uh, is the key issue to make your school organization more effective i'm trying kind of to uh, to be pointing in the direction of uh, what people can gather from our talk uh, and can get from our talk um, so that's very good about parental involvement and so that this pandemic actually uh, somehow caused parents as you said uh, to be yes. more involved with the with the students okay yes. Now, maybe in conclusion, before Mr. Olson, I would like would ask you to pray for our conference. And before you say what you would, uh, what your main message would be for the people about embracing change, I want to ask you like a few questions. And if you, if maybe both of you can answer, if you want, or at least one of you, uh, and you can answer briefly or in a more expanded way. So. First question, what has been the hardest part about moving your classes online? When I say okay, your classes, so, it means classes in general in, your, in the schools in your area. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I guess uh, there's different answers from different places. Mm -hmm. But one of the hardest parts is having lost the atmosphere sense of the learning center. Mm -hmm. um, so the students miss that. And they, they have that disengagement of the personal touch of, of a, 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 a supervisor coming to a student's office and then having a direct overview and control of their pace work. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes the, the hard part of moving back to back home is the lack of discipline and order at home and where they have, have had to learn um, how to be more uh, disciplined so that their academics don't suffer. Mm. And basically, Miss also you answered already the second question, uh, which which was, what do teachers miss about teaching in person? And Miss also maybe you can expand a little bit on this. What was the main missing part for the teachers about teaching in person? Well, of course, with uh, teaching in person, uh, students. Uh, facial expressions and the feedback you get from them and it's just hard to teach in front of a video camera or a screen uh, because you see our reaction deals with with the other person and our association directly with them and uh, and so it's, it's just it, it just involves that that be, being together 
And you know what? Not only it is difficult to okay to teach when students are behind the screen, but some students do not turn on their video cameras. That's right. right, That's right. right. And you know, we 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 actually we studied the law, and it says that actually we cannot force a student to turn on the camera unless they want to. We can yeah. we can encourage. We can just you know give them motivational messages about turning it on. But actually, it's um, and it's been a challenge for many teachers. Yeah, it does especially teaching a blank screen that's even worse than teaching a, a person whose face is on the screen <laughs> well, and, and in some areas the the internet is so poor that if you turn on the video then mm -hmm. your your whole program is interrupted and and really difficult yeah. so so mm -hmm. that that is a part of the problem too okay mrs olson what are your biggest concerns about online teaching Mm, I guess maybe um, if you're talking about an actual class, it would be uh, if the students focused, did they really focus on what was being said and how mm. much information did they really retain for that, mm. you know, online sort of class? Um, and maybe uh, so it would be the overall development of the student or maybe the lack of communication on various levels among staff, students and parents. So that might be an issue too. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ms. Tolson, anything to add to this about concerns regarding online? Well, the, the only concern, uh, if, if you have somebody that's isolated within their family for their whole education, uh, mm -hmm. how is their social development coming? And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's another thing because you know, it's important to be able to relate to others, uh, both both mm. of our age group and those in other age groups as well. Mm. And, and uh, if you're just isolated in, in a room by yourself, you don't have that. Yeah, but I will say about the social development, yeah. Mrs. Olson and Ms. Olson, last year you gave a very good, uh, a very good set of different things that can be done socially for the students, even online, and what different activities, different involvements. And I would say, like you mentioned, your uh, conference that took place online not long ago. Yes. And I believe student convention is just another event when students can at yes. least have some social awareness and interaction uh, within yes. this event. It's okay. very important. Um, another thing you mentioned several times, uh, uh, school of tomorrow curriculum and i believe that uh, your parents mostly were given the paces to take them home and then students would uh, work online with the paperback paces yet i would ask this question what kind of curriculum do we need today should it be paperback or <laughs> virtual online right and so uh most of the responses i got from the consultants because they are working every day with the students mm -hmm. is uh, probably a good mix of both hard and soft copies mm -hmm. so a mix of working uh on your paces hard copy and then working on uh e-paces or working virtually um and 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 computer-based learning because um of course, you have to have the foundation of godly biblical perspective, but you need both uh, probably in the future. It's going to go that way to be online, to be electronic. You're going to need a good combination of both in, in our ideas. Now, a few, a few years ago, there was research that was done on those that were entirely online and, and those that had a mix. And they found that even those that uh, were on entirely online uh, lacked more computer skills than those that had a mix. And so uh, it's interesting, they, they found that they only uh, learned computer skills for just those particular areas that they were working with their education program and not mm -hmm. others. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will uh, tell you that we are advocating this hybrid or blended approach. It should be online, like you said, uh, and it should be paperback. So the students would be exposed to both types of learning uh, yes. experiences and that then the education will be more, more rounded. Okay, uh, another question, um, like it is more or less understandable about teaching online uh, middle school students and high school students. How about elementary school students? What are the challenges you perceive there? 
Yes. Um, the, if they're working online at school, that might be different mm -hmm. than working online at home. But mm -hmm. if they're working online at home, then they have to have the supervision, uh, close supervision of the parents, mm -hmm. along with the academic supervisors, uh, in order to to do that. But um, it's, you know, if, even for elementary students, uh, it's if they're online, it's easier to do the e-scoring and, and it's easy, easily re, uh, monitored and mm -hmm. by the supervisors and stuff like that. So, but there needs some kind of more of a, a monitoring than a, maybe a high school student. Yeah, I would totally agree with you. And I would like, would love to underline it one more time for our conference that uh, when we work with our elementary students, uh, we need to be aware of the need for parental involvement on a heavier basis <laughs> in, a, yes. in a more <laughs> meaningful way than even with our older students. Okay, Mr. Olson, Mrs. Olson, you are, you are both involved heavily with the staff training. And so yes. my question is, what kind of shifting do we need in professional development of our staff today? Okay, well, are you talking about your tech experts or something like that? <laughs> uh, the technical part should be, yeah, the next question about the techie part. But yeah, it is, it is actually, com let's combine both, yeah. It's, so we've been training them in a certain way. Now there are, there are so many changes. So how do you feel? What should we introduce new into our training of the staff? Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, one of the most important things, if, if the parents are uh, mm. if if their students are more virtual than mm. at home then actually our training needs to involve training parents mm. as well to understand the program mm. and to use it properly uh, and i just remember that having a, a parent in the learning center uh, the, the parent had to really be trained and retrained mm. even in the learning center because the parents automatically will just want to help the student and give them an answer rather than give them the process to find the answer. And mm -hmm. you see, uh, so, and, and so when they're in the home separate, then they really need more training to mm -hmm. help them to, to do that and not just, oh, well, Johnny, the real answer is 47 and, mm -hmm. and, and the student is not really becoming that independent learner but he's just mm -hmm. borrowing an answer to put in a blank. blank. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of training, I think, is really important. Right. And then, of course, if we're talking mm -hmm. about our supervisors or administrators training, what do we put into that for our technical part? Well, if we're going to use the uh, e-training, the e-PACE training that is mm -hmm. becoming available, that needs to have a whole session or more yes. uh, mm -hmm. on site, on, on it on an administrators or, a, or supervisors, especially supervisors training, mm -hmm. where they need to experience, they need to go to a computer and experience the e-paces so that they know what the student will experience and, and also what parts they need to learn in order to run a learning center online, because that is different. Okay, very good points. Number one, I would again reiterate for our conference that uh, we need to involve parents into the training and uh, I think Mrs. Olsen might be a completely different ball game uh, for, our, for our schools, for our training, that we can actually run online training for parents and our mm. training congregation can be much bigger uh, so that, uh, of course, you being also involved with the model status <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Inspections. I will say that at the International School of Tomorrow, we begin a series of trainings for parents. And we go online, we train them in procedures and how to work with the students. And then you mentioned about e-curriculum and e-paces. Of course, at the moment, only three subjects are available, but praise God for that. And uh, we also believe that, that our supervisors and monitors have to be trained in how to use effectively uh, also electronic uh, paces and electronic curriculum. That's, that's wonderful. And I would also add to this that we also conduct training for our uh, staff how to use Zoom effectively, because this is something that they can also um, apply in the, in the uh, instruction and in their curriculum delivery. Right. Okay, okay. Uh, just to round it off, maybe I will ask you this question. So from your point of view, how does School of Tomorrow address the new challenges 
of today. <laughs> the new challenges of the day. Well, they need to provide tools and training necessary for the staff to constantly adjust uh, to a changing world while consistent, staying consistent with our divine calling. So that's a okay. short answer. To the that's a good answer. <laughs> that's a very good answer. And Mr. Olson, yeah. anything to add to this? Uh, no, I think, I think that really sums it up quite well. We need mm -hmm. to be ready because of the, the nature of the program to to uh, to be ready for any challenge that comes along. And that means uh, mm -hmm. when something new comes along, we have some new learning to to do ourselves. And in order to to keep with our goals of, of producing independent learners, individualized. Mm -hmm. What what is yeah. that? This is the your fall educators schedule for 2005. <laughs> wow. And yes, and so I was reading the sessions because you asked me the question. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, how do we how do we move forward in this pandemic? Where do we go? And I was thinking, well, what matters most? And this was by Dr. Howard, by the way. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, one of the be not weary and well doing by Mr. Lynn Stoller, oh, be not weary and well doing. Uh, uh, the paradox of leadership. What is the paradox of leadership? Being a leader, but being a servant being leader, a servant. being a servant, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, looking to the future. This is by um, some of the others that are that were there in, in Russia. And um, uh, gear up for, for the future, going forward. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, we shall reap if we faint not. All these things that I that I found there, and of course my my little notebook that I was writing, and I think this oh, was before yes. uh, before two thousand and five, I believe. I, I I can't believe I can read still read my writing from back then. <laughs> I had a a session on uh, from Mr. Len Scholarchuk, Heritage uh -huh. Matters, and uh, there are five points: mission mm -hmm. and vision. Number one, number two, biblical principles. Number three, testimonies. Have yourself a testimony. What is God doing? How did God help me? Um, character, have the, uh, the character of the students, the student involvement and the procedures, the five laws of learning. Be on level, set goals, have control, control and motivation, measurable, rewardable. And then of course, academic excellence. And so uh, you talked about, that I talked about discipline, word of God, communication, how you walk, be an example, have love and kindness. And we talked about back to God, back to parents, back to basics, the individual, and uh, do all of this with love. So how do we move forward in the future? How do we do that? By going back to the basics. God is not surprised. Like I've said that before, we go back to the basics. We, we go to our mission our vision, our calling, that hasn't changed. That should never change. We have a call on our lives and we need to keep that and renew that and move forward. And God will bless that. And, and so I, it, it wasn't mine. This was that, this was, uh, miss, this was you, Mr. Len. So this was so excited. I just looked at all the wonderful notes that I took way back many years ago. How do we move forward? By renewing our vision and going back to the basics. Okay, Ms. Olson, Ms. Olson, one more time, thank you so very much for your sharing, for sharing your heart, because I know that what you shared is not just something that you do as your job, you do it as a ministry, you are involved um, personally with the consultants, with the schools, and this is, this is really great. And uh, so we, I hope that uh, even though our talk was not necessarily uh, a common presentation that people are used to, but I'm sure that if they listen attentively, they will glean a lot of good ideas on how to make each school more effective, each family more effective, how to provide better education for the students. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring forth. That's what the Bible <laughs> is teaching us. We don't know. Right. <laughs> and... Uh, the way we are uh, working now is actually the mode that will help all of us to accommodate many, many changes that still are going to come. And uh, as we took as the Bible verse for this conference uh, from Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. 
do not be discouraged because pandemic things discourage many for the lord your god will be with you wherever you go and yes. so i believe that god is with us in russia god is with you in asia in every other country and we believe that if we work together if we work uh, under his leadership and his guidance we can be very good and effective and be good ministers for our students yes. Amen. Amen. So would you please pray for us and we'll finish our session with prayer, please. All right. Oh, Father, we just thank you so much for, for your goodness and your provision. And, and Father, we know that we don't have all the answers for the changes that will come, but you do. And, and Father, we just beseech you to, to, uh, to give us your wisdom and your understanding that we might be able to, to go forth and, and and continue with the program for our students, Father, that they might grow in your nurture and your admonition. And Father, uh, we just ask you for this wisdom to come in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One more time. Thank you so very much. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.